So first, I wanted to just point out that Jeff and I have a very daunting task of following up a meal. So we'll try our hardest to keep you alive and keep you awake, more importantly. Um, so yes, we're interested in stress response. And, and I'm going to describe to you what our lab has termed this stress response paradox, in which we believe we're fighting degeneration at the cost of cancer. Now, these environmental stresses can come in a number of different flavors, of which I've just listed a few here. And what we know is that the cell, which is in a very delicate homeostatic balance, can encounter one of these stresses. This can tip this balance and have very deleterious effects on the cell, causing it to die. Luckily, cells have evolved these stress response pathways. These can, one, sense the stress. Two, they can mount a very robust physiologic response to protect the cell during that stress. And once the stress has passed, they can help the cell regain its resting homeostasis. And each one of these stress response pathways is highly specialized to combat that particular stress. So how a cell senses a response to heat stress is going to be much different than physical stress or oxidative stress and so on. And really what my lab is very interested in looking at is trying to understand these uh, normally dormant protective mechanisms and try to use them to see if we could try to improve health and fight disease. Now, obviously, when we're looking at neurogeneration, it's obvious that the cytoprotective pathways might be beneficial. On the most basic sense, we have neurons dying, and we want to keep them alive. So cytoprotection seems like it would be a good approach. However, we begin to think about cancer, and this might not be as good. And is it possible that cancer can hijack some of these cytoprotective pathways to stay alive, to evade um, signals that would cause it to die or to senesce? And that's the question we wanted to address. And for today, I'm going to focus on two stress responses. First, the heat shock response, um, as well as a newly emerging, which is mechanical stress. And is there, a, is there a response by the cell that's initiated by physical stress? Now, this image here arguably uh, uh, represents the birth of the modern day cellular stress response field. The Ratosa lab in the early 60s was studying heterochromatin architecture, and some student put their fly salivary glands in the wrong incubator. And they came back, and they began to see these chromosomal puffs. And, and, and this didn't make sense to them, so they repeated it. And again, scattered throughout the chromosomes, in the same spots, they began to see these chromosomal puffs. And these ultimately were the sites of, of high transcriptional activity for a number of these cytoprotective genes. And then that, 20 years later, gave rise to the identification of one of the first eukaryotic transcription factors ever described, which was HSF1, or heat shock factor. Now, this is considered the master transcriptional regulator of this heat shock response. And it normally exists as an inactive monomer in the cytoplasm. But upon heat stress, it can sense this. And it activates into a trimer, which makes it competent to go into the nucleus. Once in the nucleus, it combined to highly conserved um, heat shock elements in the promoter regions of genes and promote the transcription and translation of a number of these heat shock proteins, or HSPs. And in the human body, we have over 350 of these heat shock proteins, which have been divided into six major families, um, more or less defined by their size. <coughs> And this is a very busy slide here, but I just wanted to get the point across that these heat shock proteins are also referred to as molecular chaperones, because they have a very well-defined role in vivo and in vitro in assisting in protein refolding. And that's going to be important as nascent polypeptides come off the ribosome and they need to be folded properly. However, in the case of disease, when a protein has become damaged or it misfolds due to other reasons, that these work in concert in most every, actually in every subcellular compartment to assist in refolding or reactivating these damaged proteins. And if they can't be reactivated, then some of these chaperones can actually communicate with clearance machinery, such as the proteasome system or the autophagy system, to clear these damaged proteins. And so how does this kill off a cell? Well, let's just look at heat stress. And during heat stress, we're going to introduce thermal energy into our system. And that's going to take a native protein and cause it to adopt an aberrant conformation. And this can really have a toxic loss and a toxic gain of function, depending on the protein. If this is a protein performing an essential role, 
and it misfolds, it's no longer functional, the cell will die. Alternatively, if this is a relatively benign protein that's not essential for viability, it could um, go off pathway into these misfolded forms. And if these misfolded forms accumulate in a large enough oligomer, this can stabilize that and now drive the autocatalytic conversion of the native protein into this growing amyloid aggregate here, and that this can be the toxic gain of function. So in this case, you have a toxic loss and a toxic gain of function, depending on the substrate that you're looking at. And HSF1 and its molecular chaperone network have a very well-defined role in preventing the formation of these aggregates by helping maintain these proteins in a folded or metafolded state. And even, as I said, some of the uh, machinery can also interact with degradation machinery to mark these proteins for degradation. So it would make sense if we're looking at cell viability. In wild-type cells, we subject them to heat. Over 90% of the cells are alive. Remember, the HSF is removed, and now less than 40% of the cells are alive. So HSF1 is required for heat protection. But a lot of people who were studying uh, neurodegeneration at the time, and, and in particular, these late-age onset neurodeg neurodegenerative diseases, they became very interested in these folding pathways because a number of different disease proteins seem to uh, share a very similar pathology, and that being in which a disease-linked protein can accumulate and form plaques within the brain. And I've just highlighted amyloid beta and tau, which we've heard a lot about. The prion protein can form aggregates. alpha synuclein forms aggregates termed Lewy bodies. And poly, uh, genomic expansion can destabilize Huntington and cause this. So in all these cases, it's very amazing that all of these proteins have very different amino acid structures, and they serve very different functions in the cell. But they all seem to follow a very common mechanism of destabilization and ultimately accumulation in these uh, amyloid or amyloid-like aggregates. And these are typically the pathologic endpoints of a number of these late age onset uh, neurological disorders. And just to give you a, a, a framework of what we're studying, this is just a cartoon of the Huntington gene um, in which normally you have a polyglutamine track. You have these CAG repeats that encode a short polyglutamine. However, in the disease state, due to genomic expansion, these CAG repeats are expanded, and then you get these polyglutamines that grow longer and longer. And at a certain point, these be cause the protein to become unstable and aggregate. And then, uh, as we've sort of seen here earlier today, it's the length of the CAG repeat really seems to dictate the age onset. If you have long CAG repeats, typically you're, uh, uh, you're going to begin to see neurological defects early in life, around th uh, late 30s or 40s. However, as the CAG repeat gets shorter and shorter and shorter, you're more likely to live out to a older age before the disease begins to manifest itself. And this can be modeled in worms. My lab is very interested in looking at worms and mice. We like to start off in worms and then apply these systems up until mice. And this is a study taken from Rick Morimoto's lab where he takes different length polyglutamines and expresses them in the nervous system of the animal. And this is the tip of the neuron, or the, sorry, the tip of the animal right here. And at Q40, the protein can remain soluble and these animals move fine. However, you go up to an expansion of, of 67 now the protein is unstable, it aggregates, and since it's expressed in a number of motor neurons, these animals show very impaired motility. And we can use this impaired motility as a readout for neuro neurodegeneration. So we have our wild-type animals here, moving great. Um, age match, but just a few days into adulthood, we express the polyglutamine and we see our severe motility defect. And just by overexpressing this HSF1, this transcription factor, we can completely restore motility of the animal. And if we look at the pathology, um, this is a Western blot showing the same amount of protein that's being expressed. So the HSF1 is not in, uh, infecting its expression. But we can use a filter trap analysis. This is just a biochemical assay where we use a pore size and soluble material will flow through. And it can retain the higher molecular weight aggregates. And the Q67, in the past, uh, when it's toxic, forms these aggregates as would be expected. HSF1 completely prevents this aggregation. And this is, shows a very tight correlation with its ability to protect. And this isn't just shown in worms. There had been earlier reports that this could also be the case in mice. Uh, 
Um, in this study, they're looking at a very aggressive Huntington model of expansion, and you can see in the dotted lines that the Huntington mice will die off sooner, but by overexpressing HSF1, this can prolong the onset of the disease, and it could also prevent aggregates from accumulating, as this would be normal, around 25% of the cells have it. With HSF1 overexpressed, we see it drops below 10%. So this is not just for polyglutamine. This has also been demonstrated for a number of these other uh, uh, conformational disorders that involve proteins adopting aberrant conformations and aggregating. And in all cases, HSF1 tends to keep, maintain solubility of the protein by preventing aggregates and maintaining its proper fold. And so what has evolved in the field is this very universal and linear model of cytoprotection in which HSF1 activates these heat shock proteins or molecular chaperones. These can refold proteins and that can protect against stress. And that can also delay the onset of neurodegeneration. However, um, we got kind of carried away with this and we, we forgot that maybe having, uh, preventing cell death and senescence is not necessarily a good thing in all cases. And is it possible that elevating HSF1 could tip this balance in favor of cancer? Now, there was already a lot of evidence suggesting that this might be the case. Even in 2005, there were hundreds of references uh, uh, referring to different HSPs that were upregulated in different types of cancer. And in most every cancer, they find molecular chaperones in some combination are upregulated. Rarely do they ever see them downregulated, typically always upregulated. And then Mike Sherman went on to test it well. Is it causal? Is having these chaperones there, is this going to cause cancer? And in this early study here, this is just an in vitro assay that the cancer field uses. It's a soft auger assay. Normally, healthy cells can't grow on this matrix here, so our control cells don't grow very well. But he overexpresses HSF1. Mind you, this is one of the most highly inducible genes by heat stress. It's upregulated by several thousand fold if you heat a cell. And now all these colonies begin to grow, suggestive that it's capable of transforming these cells, oncogenic transformation. But I think more importantly to show this is he took these cells and put them into a xenograft model. He injected them into mice and injected 10 animals. And out of those 10 animals, all 10 of them aggressively and quickly developed tumors compared to the control animals. So just by having these chaperones massively upregulated in the cells, that is appears to be sufficient in some cases to drive oncogenesis. And this is the culmination of a lot of work, which I'm not going to go into very, in much detail, but it's been mapped that these molecular chaperones can act at multiple points within the apoptosis pathway. They can also act at multiple points within the senescence pathway, basically to prevent cell death and prevent senescence. So this is really spelling, uh, uh, this is really, uh, suggestive that this is going to be very bad for cancer. But it wasn't until the Sue Linquist and company came along and began to say, well, we were just looking at these molecular chaperones down here. What happens if we go up to its master regulator, to HSF1? Is this possibly causing cancer? And indeed, if we go to the C bioportal, which is a great repository for all the cancers, all the human cancers that have been analyzed, is that HSF1 was, yes, indeed, very significantly upregulated. In some cases, almost 40% of the cancer biopsies that they looked at had elevated HSF1. And really, HSF1, for a decade or two, had escaped a lot of these uh, uh, sequencing studies because it's never mutated or deleted. So it never would have been picked up by sequencing. It was when we moved into the more modern era where we can actually quantify transcripts, quantify proteins, and that's when we begin to see HSF1 really standing out. And in particular, some of the major cancers would be pancreatic cancer, breast cancer, and prostate cancer, just to name a few. And then so Sue Linquist said, you know, this, those are all correlations, but is it causative? So she went in, and this is the very first study that led to a series of high-impact papers that just went on for the next uh, seven or eight years. And she's, in this case, using a skin carcinogen model and when HSF1 is deleted, mind you, these mice look relatively sickly, and the, uh, the brood sizes are much lower. But the HSF animals didn't really develop tumors like the wild-type animals did. And the tumors that they did develop 
really never really uh, got that large. So it appeared that HSF1 was not only required for tumor formation, but also for tumor maintenance and growth. And she didn't just show it in the skin carcinogen model, she also showed it in, another, in, in a number of other uh, mouse cancer paradigms. And then sort of culminating all of these studies was then she went on to show not only is it involved in cancer initiation and maintenance, but it could also drive the spread of cancer. And if we have HSF1 elevated within a tumor, that not through chaperones, but through TGF beta signaling and stromal derived factor signaling, could this drive cancer program in the surrounding tissue. And there's even a lot of clinicians right now that want to start using um, HSF1 immunostaining as a prognostic marker. Typically they find when HSF1 is elevated within a tumor, that's very bad news that that cancer has metastasized and spread to other tissues. So there's a lot of push in the clinic right now to start using this as a means to look at whether or not your cancer, or the likelihood that your cancer has spread to other tissues. And that's really what has uh, evolved in the stress response paradox. Our cells work hard to try to achieve the perfect level of HSF1 activity. If we wanted to try to treat brain degeneration and activate HSF1, then that might be good. We might be able to slow brain degeneration, but are we gonna do this at the cost of cancer? Or vice versa, what happens if we wanna knock down HSF1 to treat a cancer in some sort of combinatorial treatment? Well, that might be good, but this might drive neurodegeneration or other degenerative diseases. This isn't necessarily confined to the brain. So what are we doing to try to address this? Well, my lab is interested in screening, screening, and more screening. So what we wanna do is find novel targets of HSF1 that can maximize cellular protection and minimize this oncogenic fallout. And that's, that's our goal right now. And what we've done to do this is we've used a lot of omics, genome-wide transcriptomics, quantitative proteomics, um, and really comparing a lot of different worm strains. And this is work that I did as a postdoc when I was in the lab of Andrew Dillon. Um, in this case, I compared two normals. These are either a wild type or an HSF1 mutant, so these are not protected strains. Normal lifespan, even a little shorter. And these strains right here are very heat protected and very long lived. And we compared transcripts and proteins and found 98 that were up significantly upregulated. And we speculate that one or some of these 98 might be very important targets for, or for providing this cytoprotection. So we went in and systematically screened all 98 of these genes by knocking them down and looking at whether or not HSF1 can confer heat protection. So this would be our control. The animals normally survive at about 14 hour heat treatment. And a lot of these animals really had no effect, uh, whether it's after we had knocked down the gene, but two really stood out. And for the sake of time today, I'm not really gonna tell you about these, but I can just tell you one is the ALG1, which is an argonaut protein. This is required for microRNA processing and gene silencing. And we find that it has a very selective role in stabilizing stress response transcripts under times of stress. And when we remove it from the animal, it appears that those animals are much more resistant to getting cancer. And then the troponin C, this is more involved in the actin cytoskeleton. This is an actin a stabilizing gene. And since this discovery, we've identified a number of other genes that are involved in maintaining actin stability as we get older, because as we get older, our actin network falls apart. And we've also been able to map this to a phosphorylation site on actin, which we think is gonna have a very uh, a important role in the development of cancers. And now I wanted to describe sort of a newly emerging stress response pathway that we're interested in, and that's this idea of mechanical stress or blunt force trauma. This is not lacerating, so we're not cutting, but what happens if we take a cell and we, we throw it against the wall, basically? What's gonna happen? And this is obviously gonna have very important implications in neurodegeneration. As we've heard a few talks already talking about traumatic brain injury, this is exactly what it is. The brain hits the inner part of the skull. It receives this physical trauma. How does it respond to that? And are there clues within that responsive mechanism that might apply to cancer? So that's what we wanted to look at. And this brain degeneration, or sorry, TBI, traumatic brain injury, is a very wide spectrum, which has made this very difficult to study in humans. And the clinicians that I work with say that they, or they say that they will never see the same brain injury once within their entire career. 
And it's not all severe as the classic uh, case with Phineas Gage where he took a railroad spike through the head. It doesn't take a clinician to tell you that this is going to have very severe immediate and long-term consequences. However, in society, we're more interested in more of these moderate and mild injuries. What happens if we sustain a few concussions? Is this going to affect us later in life? And we have some correlation data in humans, predominantly from athletes, boxers, football players, hockey players, rugby players, and some in the military, that yes, indeed, this is going to have long-term ramifications. If we, take, if we take a few concussions in our life, it might affect us later on. So it's kind of a scary thought because this might not even really have any genetic predisposition. This is almost entirely environmental. So first we wanted to now frame this in the context. How are we going to study this? Well, human models, I'm too impatient for because that might take decades for these to develop. Um, and in a lot of these studies, they don't even stratify the type of in injury. Is it rotational? Is it linear? What part of the brain was hit? They don't really include this in a lot of these human studies. And this is further confounded by variable environmental and socioeconomic factors. So the field has turned to these murine models, predominantly mice and rats. But even in these, depending on the injury, it may take months or even over a year before we observe neurological dysfunction. The sample sizes are incredibly low. For anyone who really likes statistics, they would be disgusted by how low these sample sizes are. And there's some technical caveats. A number of the studies that we've looked at that we've uh, um, used these craniotomies. That means they actually have to remove the brain, skull, they have to remove the skull, expose the brain dura, and then subject that to injury. And then injuries are typically made to the exact same brain region. So all of this combined is very, very far gone from what's really happening in the human. So what did we want to do? We wanted to get even further from the human. So we wanted to try to use worms to model this mechanical injury, and I'll tell you why. They're very short-lived. We want to look at the long-term effects of mechanical stress. Well, these animals only live three weeks. It only takes them about two or three days to develop. So we could injure them at day one of adulthood, and by the end of the week, they're already middle-aged. All the tissues are post-mitotic once they hit adulthood. So when we injure them at day one, the 302 neurons that they have, those are the exact same 302 neurons that we're going to be assaying here in a week or two. And then uh, they have 959 cells total, and of those, over a third of the cellular content is dedicated to the nervous system. 302 neurons, and it's debatable, but anywhere around 50 to 60 glia. They also p p possess a nerve center, so they don't have a head, but they do have a nerve ring, which is where a majority of the neurobodies reside. And importantly, and the reason I liked it, is they're small and amenable for large-scale genome-wide studies. I wanted to take this, I wanted to start screening. I wanted to do genome-wide screening and compound screening, and that didn't seem very feasible in a mouse. So how do we go about doing this? I always get this question. Well, we need material, so we amplify up our worms, get a lot of worms, and we need to age synchronize them. So I use a hypochloride treatment, Clorox will do, and then this actually dissolves away the mother and it leaves us with a bunch of eggs. And then we can develop those eggs up into adulthood, and then we take those uh, adults, we put them into a tube, and we subject them to figure eight multidirectional agitation. It's a very technical term for we just shake them like crazy. And so what we're really doing here is we have this whole body randomized injury on the worm, which seems like it would be hard to pinpoint anything. But the fact is we can do this on thousands, tens of thousands of animals. And now we have a high enough end value that even though this injury is randomized, that we can begin to extrapolate significance out of that. And really what we've done is over the past few years, since I started my lab about 18 months ago, has gone through painstaking efforts to really try to show that whole body injury to these worms can recapitulate phenotypes that are characteristic of traumatic injury in the animal. Physiologically, we see short and long-term effects. If we injure these animals above a certain threshold, that causes the neurons to depolarize, and they go into a paralyzed or concussed state. We wait an hour or two, they come out of it, and they're completely fine. Um, we also see long-term effects. We injure them, and in a few days, we see neurological dysfunction. We can use chemotaxis and behavioral assays, and they begin to uh, uh, function worse and worse, and that gives rise to neurodegeneration, which I'll talk about in the next slide. We see the same molecular signatures. One of the earliest molecular signatures is the activation of these MAP kinase pathways. We see those activate in the worms. Uh, 
as well as when we compare transcriptomics, a lot of the same gene sets that are being activated in the rat brain and mouse brain upon trauma are also being activated in our, in our worms. We see the same metabolic effect in comatose patients. They, norm, they initially see an increase in oxidative phosphorylation. So initially a comatose patient is going to be more energetically active than anyone here in this audience because the brain's trying to reactivate itself. It needs to make ATP. It needs to try to regain these electrochemical gradients to get these neurons uh, back on track. And then lastly, we can see the pathology, which um, a number of these disease-linked proteins, which I already discussed, we can recapitulate that in the worm. But how can we, how can we do this in a large-scale study to start doing this? So in this case, I've marked the dopaminergic neurons, and I just expressed GFP. And the worms have eight dopaminergic neurons, and I've marked the six here in the head region. I'm not showing the ones in the tail. And this is what a healthy animal would look like. But if we treat it with various drugs that can cause Parkinson's disease, or if we wait long enough and the animal degenerates, they lose this signal. Basically, the, the neurons dissolve, they lose their membrane potential, and the GFP le leaks out of the cells. Well, we can use this, and we use a large particle flow cytometer. So this is a, basically a fact sorter for worms. And we can analyze hundreds of worms per second. And this is just us showing about two or 300 worms. This is an incredibly low sample size for what we can do. But even still, in the non-injured, you see there's a very big distribution, that some animals show a little bit of degeneration, but some don't. So there's a, a big distribution. But when we injure them, we see a very dramatic shift in the overall population. And this normally takes a few days. This is a progressive loss of, of, of signal. This doesn't just happen immediately after we injure the animals. And what we are very excited about is that not all neurons are created equally. We can mark different neural subsets. In this case, we've done the dopaminergic, serotonergic, and gabinergic, and we're testing the cholinergic and glutamatergic and just about every neural subset we can find. And they seem to have different sensitivities to the exact same trauma. And let's say we injure right here day one. So we even by, or sorry, we injure at time zero. And even one day after, even the dopaminergic neurons still don't really show a significant loss. But this gives way to a progressive degeneration. And even by day four, uh, uh, five days after the injury, we've lost about half of those neurons. But these don't really start to show it. The serotonergic, we begin to see a little bit of a loss. But GABA, uh, the GABA, we have not seen anything. So. So we're excited that we're beginning to identify different neural subsets with different sensitivities. And what we're really excited about is that we did identify the dopaminergic neurons, because these are the same neurons that are very particularly sensitive to Parkinson's disease. Muhammad Ali was a very famous professional boxer, and who is known, and he suffered from early onset Parkinson's disease. This is just an N of 1. However, a case study came out of Seattle where they looked at over 8,000 patients this is a longitudinal study, so this took decades. 8,000 patients, and they wanted to look at the effects of traumatic brain injury with the loss of consciousness and see if it was a risk factor for any diseases. And I'll just read this right here, where they found that a traumatic brain injury with a loss of consciousness is associated with the risk of Lewy body accumulation, progressive Parkinson Parkinsonianism, and Parkinson's disease, but not dementia or Alzheimer's disease which is, this is still a little controversial in the field, but this really begins to highlight that I think we're on the right track, that just through our worm model, that took us maybe about three or four weeks to do, that we kind of are starting to come out with the same conclusions that maybe these people took decades to do. I don't want to take anything away from this, because we've got to work our way up the evolutionary ladder to prove it, but this is just sort of highlighting the potential for this system. And really what we're doing now is we're scaling this up. We can now... Um, isolate transcripts from these various neural subsets. So what's different about the stress response in these various neurons? And that might give us some clues. We've also adapting our trauma uh, paradigm to a multi-well format so we can culture hundreds of worms in 96 well plates and we can begin to do large-scale studies. We could start to do compound drug discovery with this. This coupled with our large particle flow cytometer, which is automated, so it has a robot that can actually shoot through, th we can go through 100 plates or 200 plates of these animals in an afternoon. Um, and we'll get all the analysis. And anything that passes this test and subsequent tests, we can then move on to this sort of uh, 
This is a, a new brain trauma device that my friend and I built in a garage, and we're about to get IACUC approval on that. And so anything we approve here or that looks promising in the worm, we then work our way up into the mouse, and then hopefully then we can try to work our way up into the human. But as we're doing this, we wanted, like I said, we want to see is, is there any sort of oncogenesis that might be associated with this? So we're going to run a similar screen, uh, or a different screen, but in parallel with that. Basically, we're going to use, and I like the uh, breast cancer cell lines, but we can do any sort of breast cancer cell line. We're going to take shRNAs, or small compounds, treat these cancer cells, and we know that cancer cells normally proliferate fast. We're going to look for cells that proliferate slower, but exclusively in these cancer cells. And then if anything that passes this test, we can then use xenograft models, which we have going in the lab right now, where we can inject these cells into the mouse and uh, see if they develop tumors or if they don't. So long story, or short story, uh, I guess the short story is that we don't know whether or not this mechanical stress response has any clues to, um, to cancer, but we hope they do. HSF1 has shown us that there is some potential. So have we found the missing link? Well, not yet, but that's ultimately our goal is to find something that can prevent degeneration without causing cancer. Or is it even possible to find something that prevents degeneration and can also prevent cancer would be the, uh, would be the gold standard. And with that, I wanted to thank all of my collaborators, uh, well, all the lab that are doing all the work, my cancer collaborators, all the clinicians I work with in the various TBI clinics, um, as well as all of my funding sources. So thank you, and I'll take any questions. We have time for some questions. The microphone's coming to you. Um, based on some of our preliminary studies, we think we found a receptor that's specific for these dopaminergic neurons that might sensitize them to this. But beyond that, we're, we're really in the early stages of, of trying to define why these are most sensitive. What we're trying to do is take what we think is causing the sensitized neurons, and we're moving it to other neurons to see if we can sensitize these other neural subsets um, with that factor. Shrek? HSF1 part. So, you know, it looks like the stress pathways are all cross, have crosstalks between them. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's how you're getting like this connection between uh, effects on neurodegeneration in the Huntington model and in the cancer story. Yeah. Uh, do you think that HSF1 would have individual and specific downstream targets in each of the pathways? Or is HSF1 the regulator, or is something downstream a regulator? There's definitely something downstream. And, and in the HSF1 field, for, for decades, everyone always pointed to molecular chaperones, which they play a big role. But in the modern, in the past few years, we're beginning to find all these new targets. And that's what, what some of my studies, earlier studies, are showing is that, well, well, we need to look at the actin cytoskeleton network. It can regulate that. And the actin cytoskeleton network is highly regulatable. Just by modulating HSF1, I can get actin to be upregulated steady state levels by five-fold. So never use actin as a load control for one, but, um, but yes, like we are beginning to define these various, and are they different from tissue to tissue? I, I think they might be, so, so there's still a lot of work to do on that front. Um, going back to the first question, do the dopaminergic neurons have a different repertoire of integrin receptors that might be show differences in mechanical response, responsiveness? We've played around with, because worms have these mechani uh, mechanical sensing neurons, and we've played around a lot with those with minimal success. Um, and to answer your question, I, I, I don't know. We haven't gotten there yet. We've, We've screened, we found them, and now we're sort of backtracking to say why are these so why are these so sensitive and why are these neurons so protective? So, so these are all questions that we would love to address here, and hopefully in a year or two I'll be able to tell you. Okay, thank you so much.